And rural caucus is also, it, it gives us a chance to educate our, uh, our urban colleagues who may not be necessarily familiar with, uh, you know, with how food comes to the table, for instance. So it's also a chance for us to, to educate uh, other members. And I'd say that in our party, I can't, I'm not purview to the other discussions with, with other party, but I know from our perspective, uh, urban colleagues do take an interest in, uh, in, uh, in rural issues because it's, they either have an aunt or they have an uncle or some, a cousin that lives in somewhere. And the, it's fun for them to understand the, the, the issues that, uh, that we're going through. And, and I always say connectivity, broadband, that's our public transit. That's, what we, that's the most important investment that we can make in our communities. Welcome to Episode 9 of Fireside Chats with Aaron. I'm your host, Aaron Gowerluck. As Executive Director of the Grain Growers of Canada, I started this podcast to serve as a forum for real conversations with industry influencers and policymakers. It is safe to say that these days we find ourselves in interesting and unprecedented times. Trying to determine if we should be gearing up for a post-pandemic recovery or bracing ourselves for a second wave. As a result, the government has taken the decision to hit the reset button and prorogue Parliament, planning to outline their agenda for recovery by delivering a new throne speech on September 23rd. Today we try to address some of the uncertainty that comes with the government's recent decision, the impact it will have on key functions like committee work, and how we can expect agriculture to be positioned as part of this government's plan moving forward. Here with us to have this conversation today is someone that many of our grain grower members know well, Member of Parliament for Glengarry Prescott Russell, Francis Druin. Francis, thank you for sitting down uh, today for a fireside, a fireside chat. My pleasure. I'm glad the weather's cooperating to, uh, in yeah. order to have that fireside chat. Exactly. I think it was about 30 <laughs> degrees this time last week, but uh, fall weather here today. So, um, you know, Francis, um, there is rarely a time, I think, when, when our members um, miss an opportunity to meet with you when they're here in the nation's capital. And so it seemed like an appropriate time, I think, given that we're going to be back on the Hill in a few weeks now to have a conversation with you about some of what you're expecting um, this fall. I was looking at your bio in preparation for today's conversation. Um, many of our, of our members are familiar with you and your work with the committee, with the Agriculture Committee. Um, since you started in 2015 as an MP, but what caught my attention reading your bio is that you now have a new addition to your to your young family. You have a son. <laughs> uh, yeah. His name is Leo Xavier. So first, first of all, congratulations. And and how old is your new little guy? He's about to be 14 months next week on September 2nd. So it's been um, it's been an adjustment, a COVID adjustment for myself, uh, both myself and my wife. Obviously, we've um, We've had to, uh, to, we were working from home. So I say we always started the, uh, the pandemic, throwing the baby from one, one conference call to another. And now he's, uh, he's a walking little man. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one positive thing that I've, uh, for me personally, that I've had to enjoy over the past six months. Yes, well, I suppose if there is a silver lining to, to this, um, this madness, but uh, it would be that you've, we've all had a little more opportunity, I think, to be home with our kids, for better mm -hmm. or worse. I'm glad mine will be going back to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's dive in. Um, I mentioned that you've been an MP now since 2015, and you've already made quite a name for yourself. Since 2017 now, you have been one of the most lobbied MPs because as some sources have said, you are a rural champion. Why mm -hmm. do you think you've stood out from the many MPs who have rural ridings to earn this reputation? Well, I, I, uh, I would say I would blame it on, um, on organizations like yours organizations because you're always up on the hill. And, uh, but, but honestly, it's just for me, it's a matter of, of education. I find um, when grain growers of Canada, for instance, are over here on the hill, it's my, my duty to learn what your issues are. And committee, as you know, uh, six minutes of questions just doesn't allow for that. Um, and I know that my colleague just across uh, my neighbor, Wayne Easter, also, so is one of the top uh, person who consistently gets lobbying. And, and I'd say uh, ag is extremely busy in Ottawa and um, that's the stakeholders I, I tend to, uh, to meet with more often. Um, but I, you know, whether I agree with everything that's being presented to me, I think it's, it's my duty to understand what they're facing because 
the issues that you're bringing forward are often the issues that are reflected to farmers back home. And it's a way for me to understand that I can go back to farmer X, farmer Y and say, yeah, I know your issue. I'm working on that with your association. And it's one way that I can communicate and understand them better. Well, and we appreciate that. So thank you for always making yourself available to hear what we have to say. During the last parliament prior to the 2019 election, you were the chair of the Liberal Rural Caucus. What happened to this caucus following the last election? It's still up and uh, running. Um, For me personally, I just didn't want to run as uh, chair again because uh, you spend more time administrating as opposed to advocating for for issues. And I just want to go back to um, focusing more on on policy. And and, and I have to give it. Cody Blois, who is a member from Nova Scotia, took the the realm, if I can say. And he's, he's doing a fantastic job. And Obviously, um, the issues that are we are uh, we're going through, uh, whether it's uh, you know pre-COVID world, we were uh, discussing BRM issues. It is a uh, a commitment that we made in our platform, and it's something that we are holding, not only our government but our caucus accountable. That we are expecting, you know, some type of announcement uh, at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later. I want to ask you more about about the committee, uh, part yep. of the caucus and its work, um, just so we have an understanding of process there. But you've touched on an important topic for our members, mm-hmm. business risk management programs. We know that coming up in October, for example, we're going to see a federal, provincial, territorial agriculture ministers meeting mid-October in Guelph. Any insights into what we could expect with respect to some of the changes that we may be anticipating or that you've mentioned um, for, for business risk management programs? Well, yeah, I, I'm not purview to those discussions, but obviously um, through you guys or through other organization, and, and I know we may be discussing it later, but at committee, um, while the report's not out, we've heard the number one issue was the agri-stability program and the reference margin. Uh, we've heard things like the, the cap on the $3 million cap, taking that off. Um, whether we've heard through you know program efficiency, sometimes it's cumbersome to, to apply. So... Um, what I'd be looking at is, you know, an investment on our part from the federal government, but also I think it's equally important for provinces to jump in as well with equal funding. And if there's one thing, um, and I'm, sh- I'm sure you've realized that as well, but, you know, the, the 60-40 split, um, while it can be frustrating sometimes because if one province doesn't move, then it's hard for us to move. Um, but I know that Minister Bebo is, ex- is working extremely hard to make sure that we have, uh, we enhance this program. And, and for myself as a member of parliament, and I am a liberal, it was a part of our platform, and I'm fully expecting that we make something out of agri-stability. It's, it's written in black and white on our platform. So that's something that I'll be advocating. Whether it's mentioned in the throne speech or not, um, it's my number one issue for the next four months, hopefully, and prior to that October meeting. Excellent. I'm happy to hear that because yeah. it's also our number one issue for the next four months. So we're, we're, yeah. we're aligned there and that doesn't surprise me about you. So I, I, I think what I hear from you is that we could potentially or should be expecting an announcement with respect to agri-stability in particular from the federal government. Well, I, I hope so. I mean, uh, when that meeting, I mean, we've, we've committed to working with provinces. So out of that October 1st meeting, I, w- I mean... Um, not only, yes, we're a liberal government, but there's a lot of conservative governments provincially. And the, the what we have to focus on is is who are we serving, the membership, and the whether it's grain farmers or, or others who are dependent on business risk management. They've all asked for this change in it. I'd certainly be disappointed if, if we can't come out with a consensus to uh, to increase and, and make those changes within the agri-stability program. Whether it's re- reference margin of 85 or 80, I don't know. But as long as we increase that percentage, I think we'll make some progress. I agree. Hopefully yeah. we see a positive outcome <laughs> coming from that meeting in October. I appreciate that. But I want to go back very briefly, just for those yep. who may be less familiar with the caucus's work. Can you explain perhaps some of the issues you talked about business risk management, some of the other issues that the caucus has been exploring, what new issues you may be exploring, but also in terms of process, how the caucus brings forward some of these issues to government for consideration? 
Yeah, so we we meet we tend to meet one hour per week um, when Parliament sits. When Parliament doesn't sit, we don't tend to meet as much. Although COVID has completely changed this, so we've had a meeting as recently as two days ago. And uh, the issues that we bring up to to our caucus at rural caucus, um, it's not going to surprise many of your 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 constituents or your members. I mean, I've mentioned I've already mentioned BRM, but also broadband, um, having access to uh, to a reliable either. A, I say broadband, but I should say connectivity, either a cell phone network or um, access to internet. And I mean, if we were to unleash uh, agriculture and give them equal access to those technologies, we need uh, a reliable internet system that's that belongs in, in 2020 and not in 2005, for instance, or 2005. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be an upgrade of those systems. And I know we have committed, and I think all parties recognize that it's not a partisan issue. Um, but from our perspective, is once it's brought up at rural caucus, we then bring this uh, issues at national caucus where we will voice our concerns to uh, to the prime minister and our recommendations to the prime minister and us also our our, our colleagues at large who are part of that uh, the national caucus for instance and and rural caucus is also it, it gives us a chance to educate our uh, our urban colleagues who may not be necessarily familiar with uh, you know with how food comes to the table for instance so it's also a chance for us to to educate uh, other members and i'd say that in our party, I can't. I'm not purview to the other discussions with with other party, but I know from our perspective, uh, urban colleagues do take an interest in uh, in uh, in rural issues because it's they either have an aunt or they have an uncle or some a cousin that lives in somewhere, and the, it's fun for them to understand the the, the issues that uh, that we're going through. And and I always say connectivity, broadband. That's our public transit. That's what we. That's the most important investment that we can make in our communities. I agree, and I think that coming from our members' perspective, the pandemic certainly um, shone a light on the need for improved connectivity because so much of what we were doing, we were doing from our respective homes and farms across the country. Prior to the August 18th announcement that Parliament was going to be prorogued, the Agriculture and Agri-Food Committee, as you mentioned, um, was in the process of examining business risk management programs. Um, perhaps you can provide some specifics. You touched on this very briefly um, with respect to what you were hearing specifically from the stakeholders that appeared before committee. And then in your opinion, how you think government ought to be responding to, to those requests? Yeah, obviously, and, and I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to divulge what's in the report. We were almost in the report stage, but I, I can certainly d divulge what we've been hearing, and, and you yourself were witnesses in front of our committee, so whether it's uh, an en enhanced agri-stability program, uh, advanced payments program, um, invest in research, uh, we've talked, uh, witnesses talked about more training um, uh, on risk management uh, and tools that are available for, for farmers out there, so those are the, uh, some of the issues that we'll, we'll be probably touching on. I mean, uh, when committees in general write reports, we tend to uh, write reports based on witness testimony. And, and that's something that all parties uh, in our committee, especially. And I mean, I have to say, I think John Barlow was on this podcast and I have uh, high esteem for John and John and I get get along great we've had to uh, normally members of parliament would huddle together to to work out issues so we don't waste too much committee time but uh, John and I am I, I think I've got him on speed dial now so it's uh, we've had to call each other more often but uh, I get along with John I get along with all the members of parliament even Alistair McGregor who's on our committee and one thing that prorogation is going to change and I don't know now that the conservatives have a new leader the critics might change so I hope that we um, I don't know and our side as well committees technically the membership is uh, is obsolete so now um, the whip and the house leaders officially have to rename um, the members on committees and uh, I don't know how what's going to happen but I suppose that we will uh, the membership will slightly change for uh, for the Ag Committee. Okay I, I agree you've got some excellent committee members um, that we've certainly yeah. across all parties that mm -hmm. have taken a genuine interest in agriculture and that we've really enjoyed working with um, so um, we hope to continue to do that in some capacity but um, with respect to prorogation and this particular report and this issue, um, what do you see in terms of the future of the committee's work on BRM in particular once the, th once the throne uh, speech is delivered on September 23rd? Well, I would hope there is a there is a way a procedure that we can um, even though prorogation committees are, are are technically canceled right now there is a way a procedure where we can 
used the witness testimony to present um, the BRM uh, report to Parliament. So I would fully expect, and, and, and if I'm not on the Ag Committee later, then I would strongly encourage all the members to present that to the House so we can, and, and if, if possible, before that October meeting, if it's possible, uh, because that was the goal to inform the minister and provincial ministers on, our, um, on the witness testimony and what we've heard um, from uh, from um, from from members like you, and and provide that you know provide those recommendations so they can move forward on uh, on that and have a more informed discussion, should I say, at the October meeting. I would agree. Uh, the timing would be critical. Is that something that we as stakeholders can advocate for in terms of having that process underway prior to the meeting in October? Yeah. Well, th that's. Um, um, the time it might be real extremely close and it depends on when the um normally when parliament resumes there would the proc committee has to sit and submit the report the memberships of the committee back to the house before committee can um can resume their their work so i don't know whether or not that will be um we will have enough time to submit the full report if we if we wouldn't be able to do that then obviously i would recommend a letter as quickly as possible being sent to the minister and there's already one that we've sent as a committee prior to uh, the july date with with regards to uh, agri stability so i know and i know i don't need to we all know that Minister Bebo is, is well informed on the issues. You guys have done a great job. She already knows, but we want to reinforce the point what that uh, of, of the witness testimonies that we've heard um, at, at, in, part, in the committee. I would agree. Yeah. I think this is the first yeah. time where you've seen, and I watched a number of the testimonies that were delivered before committee from our industry partners. This is the first time I think that we've seen the industry really coalesce around one particular set of changes to agri-stability. I mm -hmm. want to stay with your work on the Ag Committee for a moment. Um, even before the pandemic, agriculture was identified in a number of reports, whether it was the Barton Report in 2017 or more recently with the Economic Strategy Table Report that was delivered in 2018, as a sector with tremendous growth potential, one which could certainly contribute to the post-pandemic economic recovery. Now that the government seems to be focused on managing uh, the impacts of COVID-19 and the sectors that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, what will this mean for agriculture? How can we ensure that our priorities and the challenges that we face currently and that we face prior to the pandemic are still getting the attention they deserve? Yeah, and, I, and I'd say over the past six months, I, and I think a farmer told me this expression and I, I loved it, and it, it was hard for the government to, to focus on long-term issues or medium-term issues when you've got sort of a crisis. And, and, and back home, as, as he said to me, it's, it's hard to focus on something else in the barn when the cow's stepping on your foot. And I think that's the whole reason for the throne speech now is to say, okay, now we, we, we can breathe, we're breathing, we're, we're, we're treading water, we can sort of look at the next six months to, to a year because plans have completely changed. I mean, families, uh, farmers and governments and businesses, their plans of January 2020 have been thrown out the, thrown out the door and now we got a reset. So I think that's the whole goal of throne speech. And I fully expect to see uh, agriculture, and you're completely right, the Barton Report identified agriculture as one of these pillars where we can grow uh, the economy and 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 if there's one thing that we can all learn from COVID is that things have changed supply chains are vulnerable um, our transportations our transportation systems are vulnerable now with COVID-19 so I and we've heard this from witness testimony prior last year I mean I still can't believe that because of rain in BC um, you know we get cars grain cars backed up because it's raining and they can't load the the trains the, the the boats or the ships i mean that's those are investments that should be done uh, in the immediate so those are things like this i'll be looking for and how can we imp improve our transportation system unclog the systems where they are and that's something that you know I, I look forward to hearing from members and i've always discussed this i think it's extremely important if we are to i know we 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 export 50 percent of what we produce but if we want to to increase that then we are you know it, it needs to go to uh to uh export markets but we need a good tra reliable transportation system and I think that's one of the issues that uh, that I'll be working on personally um, with whomever wants to do that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, with respect to the impact that the pandemic has had on the agriculture sector, I want to point to one issue in particular that our members have shared with us. They've expressed concerns over the fact that we've essentially lost a year of field trials. And you know, while we understand that the health and safety of employees is of the utmost importance, 
this particular setback is definitely going to have a significant impact on the development and approvals of new varieties, um, which is the lifeblood of our industry. If agriculture is going to drive the economic recovery, it's going to be from innovations through research and our ability to stay competitive globally. With the speech from the throne coming in under a month, can we expect the government to commit to expanding agriculture research? Um, well, I, I wouldn't presuppose or pre predetermine what the throne speech is going to say, as I'm not pr uh, privy to those discussions. But research in general has been highlighted um, through witness testimony, and if we are to make those, uh, if we are to develop new market opportunities for tomorrow, obviously research has to be part of that. So whether it's uh, and and we've i think we've demonstrated that in the past with the, the research clusters that are there and ag is obviously a big part of that and i've had the opportunity to to visit that just as they were getting to set up and if it's one thing COVID hit uh, we, we can't I, I i'm not getting much of a status but um agric i would expect that research plays a significant role in uh in whether it's it's going to be mentioned in the throne speech or not research has to play a significant role um, for uh, for the ag community and and then whether it's through partnerships with the private sector i think i think it just it's an uh, it's inevitable that we have to continue those investments it's just it just it wouldn't make sense to not um not invest in research especially now that all all economies will be are, are have been hit probably almost equally by COVID-19. Those countries that will be able to unleash the power of ag will be the ones that will be successful and research certainly plays a role in that. Thank you. As you know, Grain Growers has long been calling on the government to develop a, an offset protocols that recognize the practices that farmers have voluntarily adopted to reduce carbon emissions such as conservation tillage. Mm -hmm. Our members met recently with Environment and Climate Change Canada, and they indicated, ECCC indicated, that conservation or zero tillage protocol is not something that's going to be included in the systems offset program. ECCC indicated they're only interested in incentivizing new practices, not recognizing the ones already adopted by farmers. Farmers are already being taxed for grain drying, which is an essential mm -hmm. practice that currently has no viable alternatives. And we're now learning that they're not going to be recognized for being early adopters of environmentally friendly practices on their farms. Help me to understand, Francis, how this happens. Um, well, I'll tell you the truth, I'm not sure, but uh, I know that comments, I think, are being uh, still being received up until it's closing soon, I think September 4th, if I, if I, uh, if I recall. I get the sense um, from, from environment, per perhaps, um, they're looking at new ways to, to reduce your carbon footprint, and I know farmers have done a great job as, uh, of doing that, and, 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 uh, and no tillage, I mean, it's, it, it's a practice that, that is widely adapted in the West, but not one that is widely still adapted um, in central Canada and Ontario, and especially in my, in my writing. I see some farmers do it, but not everybody. So that's something that, um, you know, I'll obviously be in communications with, uh, with Environment Canada just to say, what's the policy rationale for, for not allowing this? The other thing, and I'd be curious to find out, is um, um, when you're planting crops or cover crops, is there one that capture um, carbon more than other crops and that's certainly something that um, you know when you're when you're, you're you're we're talking about offset I certainly think that 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 should play a role and I don't know if there's been a lot of research and that's as I was reading some of the comments I'm that's something that actually I'm not well educated in, in that yet so I'm happy to be working with uh, with you guys on this if there's something that we can do but agriculture for me has to play a role in these offsets they play a great role and um, I, I'm not aware of those comments, but I certainly will voice those concerns to uh, to the minister because I know that um, if it was widely adopted across Canada, I'd say, yeah, okay, I get it. I get why they wouldn't allow it because they want to further reduce the, the carbon footprint. So they they're looking for new ways to do that, but ne it's not widely adapted across Canada. So I, I'd say the policy argument continues to make sense, um, but I don't know, you know, sometimes I win, sometimes I don't. <laughs> Well, we, we, yeah. we appreciate your willingness to have the conversation nonetheless. Yeah. So thanks very much for letting us bring that to your attention and we will follow up. Perhaps um, perhaps one final question before I let you go. I know you've indicated that um, that you can't shed uh, share any insights in particular with what we can expect to see in the throne speech on the 23rd. 
But from your perspective as someone who is so dialed into the sector and, and does meet frequently with stakeholders in the agriculture sector, what are you hoping to see in the throne speech with respect to agriculture? Well, for, for uh, you've heard Minister Freeland, the new Minister of Finance, talking about inclusive growth. And I know sometimes we look at uh, social disparities between um, classes, if I can say, of inclusive growth. But inclusive growth for me also means that rural Canada has to play an equal part in that econ ec economic recovery. And agriculture certainly plays a role in that. So obviously, uh, I'd be looking in the throne speech to see some type, a wink, wink uh, to, to the ag community to say, you know what, you, you guys, we've already highlighted this through uh, through the Biden report. We know that you're, there's a there's huge potential for the ag sector. So obviously, uh, if we want a strong economic recovery, agriculture has to be part of that. So in the throne speech, I'd obviously looking for a, uh, uh, a signal that our government continues to believe that agriculture needs to be part of the economic solution and that economic growth and, and participate in the innovation as well. Great, thank you. Yes, uh, Minister Freeland did also mention in some remarks that were given just a few days ago, something with respect to a green recovery. Um, and, and I don't think we've seen any details there yet, but I don't know if perhaps, I don't mean to put you on the spot, if there's anything more you can share with respect to what you think is part of that vision for a green recovery. Well, I know, and, and I mean, this is, again, my own personal view, and I know that um, uh, the carbon tax has been an issue, for, especially on the grain drying side, and I've certainly had many discussions in my in my writing with that. And I, for me, uh, and it's not my government's position, but for me, I had committed to farmers back home not to support that. Um, simply because I live close to Quebec and on the other side in the province of Quebec, they are exempt. And if there's one thing that um, at some point we may need to change our strategy and advocate towards provincial governments so we can get an exemption because they do have the power to do that. They just need an acceptable plan that will meet the federal goals um, and, and our Paris Agreement. Um, but on the green recovery, obviously, I know that Prior to COVID-19, there was discussions on how can we help farmers uh, adapt more green technologies, whether it's, uh, uh, I, I've seen a whole bunch of, of, of uh, heat capturing technology for, uh, for barns or, or having more efficient grain dryers. And I know um, they're not, uh, you know, propane is still a huge part of grain drying in, uh, in, 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 in Canada. Um, but is there technologies that currently exist out there? And if not, well, can we invest in that research capacity to develop those new technologies so we can better serve uh, the community at some point? Uh, because grain dryers are not exactly cheap. Uh, you don't buy that every year. Uh, you buy them, uh, some buy them, some are 20 year old. Uh, I've, I've heard some have them for, 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 for a much longer term. So, I mean, there's also that reality. We can't help everybody who, uh, who doesn't have, um, who's not ready to buy a new grain dryer. So that's something that I'm certainly voicing to my government. So yeah, I know we want to help them transition towards greener technologies for grain dryers, but not everybody's ready to make that investment. There's some that already bought them. They just bought them five years ago. So I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you, just like you don't change cars every year, you don't change a grain dryer every year. So those, those, those are the economic realities. And that's something that, you know, through you guys, that you're voicing those concerns either through me and through other members of parliament. I think um, when we talk about the green recovery, it's not just about uh, a carbon tax. It's also about making um, green investments and farmers should be playing a role in this and they are playing a role in this but how can we further help them excellent we uh we're planning again to be uh to be we were planning again to be on the hill to meet with you and others here in the nation's capital as part of grain week post-harvest grain week in mid-november and now i think we're planning for a virtual grain week to do more of what we're doing here online do you have any insight in terms of how you'll be reaching out to stakeholders and constituents now given the pandemic? Are you expecting that you may be able to have in-person meetings this fall or are you thinking that most of it's going to continue to be virtual in nature? Well, I certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm more of a, of a, of a, of a in-person uh, MP, but the issues are with uh, uh, policies for buildings. So they're still not allowing, uh, for instance, in my building, and I got in trouble in July for having somebody here, but they don't allow outsiders to uh, to come to our building right now. So that's the issue that we have to uh, that we have to face. But restaurants need our support. So happy to have a coffee across the uh, across the street if you uh, if you are in town or if some of your members are in town. I'd be happy to, as always, I'd be happy to do that. But um, for some MPs, it's going to be, it, it will have to be a, a virtual end. 
Parliament has not yet been decided on how it's going to happen. I suspect probably a hybrid model. So mm -hmm. just like uh, you guys, you may be uh, having a hybrid lobby day. Uh, maybe you will have some in-person meeting, in meetings, but some MPs may not be in town as they will be meeting, um, joining or participating in Parliament through uh, on a virtual basis, essentially. Good insight. Thank you. I know many of our members really appreciate the, the in-person um, aspect of, of meeting with you and others, but I expect that it will be a hybrid. And the one, the one thing I think, the one silver lining to that has been that we've been able to, to, to reach so many more people by having these virtual meetings. It's, it's considerably more efficient, but um, so we'll yeah, see. absolutely. And you haven't had a, a vote bell going off uh, <laughs> and canceling a meeting and whatnot. So it's, uh, yeah. it, it's, it, it, there's an advantage to every situation. I appreciate the insight. We might consider a hybrid approach. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to join me for your office, from your office in the nation's capital for what is our first actual fireside chat here. It's, it's finally cold enough in the nation's capital that we could build a fire. So thank you for joining me. And thank you, everyone, for listening to the ninth episode of Fireside Chats with Aaron. We'll be back in two weeks' time with another special guest. In the meantime, if you want to stay up to date on all things GGC, please follow us on Twitter at Grain Growers or on Instagram at Canada's Grain Growers. Until then.